Today we speed through about 60 years of the history of the kings of Judah. We meet Manasseh, Ammon and Josiah. Manasseh was put down as being one of the most evil kings and Josiah one of the greatest. Manasseh is reputed to have taken Isaiah and put him in a log and sawn him in two. And it's in the 13th year of Josiah that we see the prophet Jeremiah beginning to preach. In fact, we looks like we have about 50 or 60 years without any prophetic word. One thing we do see is that Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah. And how can it be that such a poor king comes from such a good king? What we see is the formative years of Manasseh were spent in a time when his father had, although having served the Lord faithfully, had begun to be full of pride and had moved away into his own self-importance. And so the message that this young man, who was only 12 years old when he comes to the throne, is given is, you are important, what you think is important. And Manasseh went after himself and his own ways. He defiled everything of the temple. And yet this man, who is put down as being one of the most evil kings that Judah ever had, was taken into exile, and there he repented. There he fell before the Lord and was restored to his throne. What amazing mercy the Lord has. What awesome mercy that someone who is so evil, so wicked, yet in his repentance discovers the grace and mercy of the Lord and is restored. There is hope for us all there. And Josiah, this young man, eight years old when he came to the throne, immediately a few years later began to seek the Lord and began to do things. And as his heart moved more and more towards the things of the Lord, it is at that time that the Lord brought a young prophet, Jeremiah. And as I look at the dates, I even question, was Jeremiah born? even in those years, just around when Josiah came to the throne. It's interesting also, just as we leave today, to note that when Josiah came to the throne, and when Jeremiah began to preach 13 years later, there is a major shift going on in the nations of the world. And we will see that in the next few days. How easy it is for us to think that when things have improved a little bit, that God will be happy and he'll be contented to compromise. That little bit of improvement actually is a window for the Lord to start making major changes. And how easy it is for us to be people who say, wow, I'm through that problem. I just hang on here. There is no hanging on here in the kingdom. The Lord is looking for a people who are dedicated to him in every way. We praise God that young Josiah has begun to seek after the Lord. And the Lord has used this opportunity to speak again. Perhaps there had been uh, prophets coming in the time of Man Manasseh and Ammon. But who knows if they had not even been cut down even before they had a chance to speak. But here was the opportunity when the Lord is beginning to restore for the prophetic to come. The Lord is calling his people to a purity and holiness, to repentance. His promise is always, if there is repentance, if there is a turning again to me, I will heal the land. But if there is no healing, if there is no turning, if there is no repentance, then the things that I have spoken, and in all of the time of Jeremiah, there is this constant, choose this day. Choose whether you will return to me with a whole heart or continue on the way of sin. There may be changes going on in the nation. And it is fascinating to see the, the growing of that change, the growing of what is going on. But another thing that's most beautiful is whenever we see the prophets, their own character and the character of the Lord comes out. 
we see the Lord representing through their hearts what his heart is. We see his speaking through certain prophets who are farmers about farming. But Jeremiah is a man with a tender heart. He's a young man. He's not been hardened by the things of the world. And when he responds in tears, we see that he is expressing the heart of the Lord. Even as Jesus cried when he looked at Jerusalem, we see the Spirit of God weeping through Jeremiah. The Lord is not a God who is hard and brings justice and judgment with, for the sake of it. He is one who is looking. It is his kindness and his love that actually brings repentance. Jeremiah is continuing to call out with the voice of the Lord to the people and to the leaders of the land. He's calling them and saying, the sin of your fathers is going to be avenged. Turn to me, turn again, turn again. And all this time since the beginning of Josiah's reign, there has been desire to seek after the Lord. He's begun to do the things. He's begun to restore the temple. And then we find this amazing thing that in the middle of the restoration of the temple, the book of the law is found. Josiah has been carrying out the work of the Lord without the word of the Lord. He's been doing the things that he thought it would be good to do, but actually he has not known what it is the Lord wants of him. He hasn't been working and understanding the covenant that has been made. He hasn't understood. He thought, if I can just do it in my own strength, if I just do what I think is good. But the Lord now starts to reveal and they start to see the Lord has made a covenant with us and that covenant is clear and we need to do and fit in and be in our covenant position in him. Perhaps if we're in that covenant position, there can be mercy. And the Lord is beginning to do something quite amazing in the reign of Josiah. And Josiah sends the leaders to see a prophetess. And she says, if you serve the Lord, you will not see this judgment. This judgment will come, but it won't be in your lifetime. That's amazing as all the things that are going on around the nations. In Josiah's lifetime, there was peace in the land. The book of the law has been found and the people have come together and the king listens as the five books of the Pentateuch are read before him. The full terms of the covenant are read out. That means that included in there are the blessings and the curses that are covered in Deuteronomy. And at the end of it, the king is heartbroken. He recognizes that they have not served the Lord as they should. And he decries and says, we will restore our part of this covenant. We will serve the Lord. And he goes on and he steps up and he begins to cleanse the nation. He takes out all those who are full of spiritualism, all those mediums, all those who are trying to get to the spiritual, but not through the truth of the Lord. The clarity of this is real. It goes through and he declares and they put on the most amazing Passover. The Passover is celebrated in a way that it has not been celebrated for hundreds of years. And it is celebrated in truth and in love. And the Lord is pleased with this. He is pleased and gives a 10 year time of peace in the land of Judah, in the middle of the turmoil of the nations. In the meantime, Prophet Nahum has stood up and has gone before Nineveh and just like Jonah did, tells them what the Lord is about to do. But this time there is no repentance. And in fact, at the end of that 10 years of peace in Judah, the nation of Assyria is under threat. The armies of Babylon are around the city of Nineveh. The Lord is bringing judgment on those he has used to chastise his people. 
He will always do that. Anyone who serves the Lord out of a wrong heart will find themselves in a place of judgment to the level which they have judged others. It's so easy for us to pick and choose verses out of Scripture. I, I have a Bible, an old AV, on the, my shelf. And if you look at the headings at the top, wherever there's something bad going on, it says, Judah in its wickedness gets this. But whenever there's a promise, it says, and this is God's promise to the church. You know, actually, we need to be recognising that God is the same God of the Old Testament and the New. And here we have this incredible passage of Habakkuk beginning to cry out and saying, Lord, the sin in the camp, when are you going to judge them? When are you going to come and sort it all out? And the Lord answers him and said, I'm coming soon and I'm going to send a people who will bring judgment. And then Habakkuk turns around and says, wait, 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 you're using people who are worse than we are to judge us. And God is saying, yes, but you see it and look at it and recognize that I am the one that's in charge. I am the one that's bringing justice, but I'm also the one that's bringing redemption. The Lord is great, and he is doing a work, and he will do it even in this day. Where his church has fallen, where his church has moved away, he will bring his discipline into his church. He will do this for the purpose of purifying his body so that his glory may be seen. We've seen this in nation upon nation across the world. We've seen it where the church has been disciplined by the world. And yet, in the middle of it, a beautiful, pure, believing church has risen up. Let us not be surprised in the West that we find the church being pushed into a corner and actually being disciplined by the Lord using the world to bring us to a place of holiness and repentance so that he can bring his glory afresh. I don't believe the Lord is going to come and, and sort things out unless we actually take seriously his call for purity and holiness. And then we see moving on to yet another prophet in Zephaniah. We all perhaps know those beautiful verses of the Lord dancing over us with singing. But what we also see there is him speaking of a time of justice, a time of judgment, but a time of God's glory. And so many words in Zephaniah speak to the future kingdom where Jesus returns and all people come under his sway. We look to that and our heart is towards establishing and living kingdom principles here and now so that the road may be made straight for the Lord to come. Today is one of those days when it might help just to look at some of the context of what we're looking at. There are three major empires, and Judah is right in the middle like a billiard ball being knocked about. And we have the Assyrian kingdom, which is now shaking. The empire is breaking. Nineveh has been sacked by Babylon, this new emerging empire. And from the south, there is Egypt, who recognize that this is their moment to really take hold of the area around them. As Assyria is shaking, that they move to put a point by which Babylon will have to stop. So really, they go and line up alongside Assyria. But really their intention is to grab hold of the place. So this battle is brewing. But on the way there, Josiah, this great reforming king of Israel, steps out and says, hang on a minute. This is my moment. I can, be, I can defeat the king of Egypt and be free. It's foolishness. The Lord tells him through Jeremiah, this is foolishness. But the king Josiah this great reforming king has become proud in his old age. And he goes out and he's killed. And the Egyptian army goes off to war. But at the same time, 
in the vacuum that is left behind. Ammon and Moab and Philistine try to grab hold and they begin to, to try to come in and, and take hold of what there is. And Jeremiah comes in and say, speaks and to those nations surrounding, telling them that the Lord is displeased with them because of their grubby hands and trying to go in and steal what is not theirs to steal. That they are going in and trying to bring a punishment that the Lord has not ordained. And because of that, he is going to judge them harshly. It's interesting to see how all this is playing out. But it actually is the end for Judah. The time is coming when it's all going to unravel very, very quickly. When wars rage and empires come against each other, the little men in the middle get battered. Josiah had died in battle against the king of Egypt who was going to fight the king of Babylon. And on his way home, he stopped off again in Jerusalem to find that Jehoahaz had been made king. The king of Egypt deposed him and took him as a prisoner back to Egypt and put in place his brother Jehoiakim and put him there as a puppet leader, serving the king of Egypt. Now this man was wicked, and at the same time, Jeremiah is continuing to preach and continuing to declare what the Lord was doing. As he did so, the older, wiser men stood on his behalf and said, Look, king, who was trying to kill Jeremiah. At the time of Hezekiah, Micah the prophet stood up, and told people to repent. The Lord's judgment was coming and they did repent. And in their repentance, the Lord brought safety to them. And so the king relented, but it was not a safe time to be a prophet. A prophet called Uriah rose up and began to declare what God was saying. And they went after him to kill him and he ran to Egypt. And the king sent men after him to kill him there. Jeremiah was in danger. And a man called Iacam stood there next to him, protecting him. But the mob killed him. This was such a time the, 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 for, to being a prophet. Jeremiah was in danger and would be in danger for the rest of his life. Jeremiah then begins to continue to call out that the Lord was bringing justice. The king of Babylon then swept through and defeated the, the king of Egypt. And all of a sudden, Jehoiakim was now a puppet to the king of Babylon. But that didn't take long because he was going to rebel against them. And as he rebelled, Babylon came back again in Nebuchadnezzar and defeated him. And they took away the young men as captives back to Babylon. But at that time, Jeremiah declares, this captivity will last for 70 years. There will be a purging of the land, and then I will bring my people back. It must have been the, in the ears of one of the young captives as he was led away, a young man called Daniel, taken to Babylon. And he is there remembering that this time was for 70 years. It's a dangerous time to be a prophet of the Lord in the courts of King Jehoiakim. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah, give the people another chance. Let them hear again. Write down everything. And Jeremiah writes out every prophetic word that he's written and had been given in the time of his ministry. And he sends his scribe to go into the temple on a day when everybody's going to be there and speak it out. And the people are impacted by this. And this word is taken to the king whose heart is so hard that as he listens it, he just burns it. He just burns it on a fire. And the Lord says to Jeremiah, write it out again and send it again. 
And the king in his anger comes against Jeremiah and his scribe. But the beauty of it is that the Lord spoke to Baruch and said, don't be afraid. I will hide you. I will care for you. Even though they come after your life, I will hide you. The promise of the Lord is that I will hide you under the shadow of my wing. When there is trouble, when fear and trouble comes against us, we may actually not get away from them physically, but we need not fear because we can be hid in Christ. Nothing can touch our hearts and our spirits if we are hid in Christ. The Lord is our hiding place. As he was for Jeremiah and Barak, the Lord was their hiding place. And he is our hiding place too. Jeremiah continues to preach to the people and to the king. He continues to declare what God is saying. And God is talking now about total destruction. And yet, the people are saying, well, we've been under occupation of the Egyptians for five years. And now the Babylonians have come and they're going to take hold. And we've got used to occupation. Okay, we're not got the freedom we had before, but it's not the end of the world being occupied. We can live with this. And Jeremiah is declaring to them, there isn't going to be a living with this. God is going to deal. If you do not turn, God is going to deal. Our hearts are trying to live with a compromise. Live in half the kingdom is never going to work. And we also now have two theatres going on. We have what's going on in Jerusalem. But the young men have been taken to Babylon. And we meet an incredible set of young men, and Daniel in particular, who said, actually, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to serve him regardless of what it costs. I'm going to put his way first, regardless. And the Lord honors his diligence and his sacrifice and his perseverance and his honesty. The Lord honors Daniel in so much as the sacrifices that he makes to serve the Lord. In the heart of a hostile place, the Lord uses it to bring him honor and respect. And the Lord pours out his spirit on Daniel, giving him more wisdom than all of the men around. The Lord uses those that serve him with a whole heart. He will use them in the places where he has put them. We have two parallel stories going on today, hundreds of miles apart. The young princes have been taken back to Babylon to be trained as, uh, as wise men there. And at the same time, Jeremiah continues to cry out and say, the end is come, don't settle for anything other the full repentance. He's in amongst the people and he's declaring it and they're refusing to listen. And Jeremiah cries out to the Lord and the Lord says, that's it. Stop praying for these people. Jeremiah's heart is torn. He's desperate to see the people of God turn back to God. And yet what he sees is the Lord saying, that's it. Just shut your mouth. No longer pray for them. That's hard to even understand. But back in Babylon, we had Daniel standing on the principles of God and excelling even in those in the place where everything is against them. The young men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, find themselves confronted by a choice. Either worship the king or worship the true king. And they say, we cannot do anything but worship the Lord our God. And in that, they're thrown into that fire. But the Lord protects them. As they're being thrown in, they say, the Lord will protect us. And if he doesn't, we still will serve him. That is such a key to our faith that we declare, no matter what, whether I live or die, it doesn't impact how I serve the Lord. And the Lord undertook for them 
and he stood with them, even as one like the Son of Man. And the king recognises that the Lord is Lord. In the meantime, Daniel is put, given the opportunity to show the spiritual power of God. The king has declared, I've had a dream, but refuses to tell anyone what the dream is. And Daniel boldly stands up and says, I can't do this, but the Lord I serve can. Everything that they're doing in a place of captivity is still magnifying the Lord their God. While in the place where they've come from, the people are still groveling around in the dirt. There is a principle that God works on. When he brings judgment, he brings it in two counts. One of them is in justice and right and wrong, and the other one is based on covenant. We'll see in the book of Revelation that two books are open. One is based on what you have done, and the other one is based on the covenant. And Jeremiah is in a place where the Lord has called him and said, go and stand before the people and say, you have broken the covenant. I set out the terms and you agreed to it. And in that covenant, you said that if you agree to serve me, I will bless you. But if you choose not to serve, then I will punish you. And the judgment that is coming on you is not just because of what you have done right or wrong, but it is because you have broken the covenant. And Jeremiah is speaking in, of the prophetic that is being spoken. The people are saying, God is good. He'll be with us. And they are searching after the truth and using every device of every evil religion that is around them. They are looking at the stars. They're looking at the signs. They're looking at this. They're looking at that. They're using everything that the enemy kingdoms would use and saying it's working for them. It will work for us. And they are saying we have the law of the Lord and we are using it to divine things from. They are using methods to get into the word they're using it as magic portions this actually continues right the way through and we'll see this in acts of apostles but the people are turned away from god they're serving idols in the name of the lord and they cannot see what they're doing and the lord has said you have broken my covenant if you serve me i will protect and care for you. But if you disobey my covenant, then there will be punishment. Jeremiah has been through so many things. He's brought the word of the Lord openly to the people. He's brought the word of the Lord to kings. He's brought the word of the Lord to rulers. He's gone and done. He's gone into nations and done it. And many have tried to kill him. He's been imprisoned. There's been plots on his life. The Lord has protected him. But this plot from his own family has gone in and it has knocked him. He's gone into a time of self-pity, of calling on the Lord. says, why is it? It's just not fair. And the Lord has just turned to him and says, if such a little thing as this is knocking you, how can you do it when I'm calling you to run and speak to the very greatest people. And the Lord is just calling out to Jeremiah and says, also just look at it. If you think it is bad when your family turn against you, what do you think it feels like to me? The Lord and God of this people, when they have not only turned against me, they have gone after other gods. They have hurt me deep and I must deal with it. But if you'd insist on your self-pity, I cannot do anything for you. You must look to me. And I'm saying to you, Jeremiah, if you look to me, you will find me. I will restore you. I will bring you back to that place of me using. And I will use you for my kingdom. I will use you again. Stand up and declare what I've told you. Do not be afraid because I will protect you.
Yesterday was a significant day in Jeremiah's life when he had to step out of the self-pity and return again to serving the Lord regardless. And he went on and the Lord now gave him a new challenge of not being married. We've seen so often that the marriages and the lives of the prophets symbolize so much about what the Lord is doing with the nation. And he's speaking and saying that things are going to get so bad that it would be better if you were not married. And Je Jeremiah just simply goes on and says, I'll do whatever it takes. He says, you are my strong tower. You are my strength. You are the one that I trust. I will do anything. And he goes on. And the Lord is beginning now to speak about why he's sending them into exile. I'm sending them away to purify them, to release them from their sin so that they may return and begin again. Just as I took them to Egypt to prepare them to serve me, I'm giving them another chance that they will return from Babylon and they will serve me. The Lord is so merciful. Even though he says I'm judging, even though he says I'm coming in to deal and chastise, he is saying there is mercy. And then we have this beautiful passage about a, a people group within the tribes of Israel who have been faithful through generations. And the Lord says, because of your faithfulness, I have seen you and I will protect you and I will guard you and you will be protected in all things and grow in God. We're going to begin today just by having a quick catch up on the history that's going on and the political maps of the area being redrawn almost on a day by day basis. We'd seen Assyria fall and the king of Egypt come to battle against the new power Babylon and be defeated. Egypt withdrew and Babylon came after them, but Egypt held its ground. And Jerusalem has been this billiard ball getting knocked about in the middle of it. And Jehoiakim. The king of Judah had been a puppet to Egypt and then became a puppet to Babylon. But when Babylon came again, trying to totally take out Egypt and failed, they came to Judah and destroyed Judah. Jehoiakim was killed. His son Jehoiachim was taken in chains back to Babylon and a new king, Zedekiah, was put in place to serve Babylon. As the exiles go, this is a second set of exiles being taken away and the temple has been destroyed and the things have been taken out of the temple and taken back to Babylon. And at this time, Jeremiah is speaking and he's saying, God's in charge of this. In fact, he's going to use this time. You're going to come back and he is going to put a new king on his throne. And this king is going to be a king who reigns forever. Even in the middle of everything going wrong, the Lord is making a promise for a future that is brighter than anything they've ever seen. And then there's a little turn towards the prophets. There are so many prophets in that time. And they are speaking, and they are speaking peace, peace. Just as when Israel fell and the prophets spoke peace, peace, here also the prophets are speaking what the people want to hear. The prophetic of the darker side is always going to be able to pick up what's in people's hearts and what they need and will prophesy to them what they want to hear. We'll see this again when we're reading Ezekiel. And it's so important that we realise that the Lord brings a word which brings repentance, which brings life and brings hope. A word from a false prophet will soothe where you are, but will ultimately lead to death. Today's passage contains some of the most beautiful promises there are in Scripture. Where the Lord says that he has plans for you, plans for prosper you, that for your good and not for your harm. And it's worth looking, I think, for just a moment to see what the context of these verses are. 
and see how they should apply very strongly in our lives. We've just seen that the Lord has likened the two groups, one in Jerusalem and one now in Babylon, to two bunches of figs. One is ripe and going rotten, and the other is good. It's interesting that the one that is good is the one that has been sent to Babylon, and the rotten, overripe one is the one still in Jerusalem. But at the same time, so Jeremiah is writing a letter to them. He's telling them, the Lord has sent you there for 70 years. But at the end of that 70 years, he has a promise for you. It's been interesting, as we've read through often, there has been a, a statement saying, I'm not going to bring this judgment in your lifetime, but in the lifetime of your children. And the people said, oh, that's all right, then I'll be okay. Imagine the Lord was saying to you, I am making a wonderful promise and a plan for you, and it will come about in 2087. And you think, wow, that's really, really good. But the Lord is calling the people to establish themselves, put down their roots again, be followers, be obedient to him, serve him with all they have, for he is bringing a promise of redemption. And it will be not just for them, but for their children and their children's children. And he will restore what they have lost and what they are walking in punishment for. He is going to promise a restoration. And for us, we need to recognize that the Lord's promises are yes and amen, every one of them. And some of those things we may not live in the good of, but let us live ready for the next generation to walk not in judgment on our past, but on the blessings of our present. Mm -hmm.